When first-person shooters were introduced in the early 90s, most of the studios making them were content with keeping their protagonists silent. They believed that doing so would allow players to step into their shoes with far greater ease and that the worlds their shooters explored already had plenty to say in their place. Any additional dialogue would be novel, yet wholly unnecessary. But before these assumptions could become fact, a PC game from Texas-based developer 3D Realms entered the market and proved that dialogue, if done well, had its place within the genre. Oh, yeah. This game was Duke Nukem 3D, a body shooter that followed its titular protagonist on a quest to liberate Earth from an alien menace and riveted a generation of players with its real-life settings, high level of interactivity, and one-liner spouting protagonist voiced by John St. John. Like While Duke proved a figure of controversy due to some of his more salacious tendencies, most found that his added character greatly elevated the rest of the experience around him. And before long, gamers on almost every other platform under the sun were nodding in agreement alongside their own copies of it. In the wake of such widespread success, 3D Realms had every intention of building Duke Nukem out into a sprawling franchise and producing sequel after sequel that would outdo its gun-toting opus. Before long, however, those in control of the series found themselves corrupted by their own success, and these plans began to veer off course. While there would be no shortage of Duke Nukem spin-offs that would pop up in the years following 3D's release, a proper follow-up to the shooter would remain locked in development hell within 3D Realms' offices for years after its announcement. What was once an immensely promising series became one of the video game industry's longest-running jokes. And when 3D Realms finally managed to get its prodigal entry out the door, most who played it found that the joke was on them. This is the rise and fall of Duke Nukem. During the 1990s, few PC game developers were as successful or pioneering as Apogee Software. Founded in 1987 by Scott Miller, the studio rose to prominence after Miller stumbled upon a novel new model by which he could distribute his outfit's games. Instead of releasing them online as shareware and asking for donations, or charging a fixed price up front, Miller realized that he could make far more money from them if he released their first few levels free of charge, and then presented players with the option to purchase the rest of the experience upon their completion. This model, which became known as the Apogee model, proved considerably profitable for Miller during the studio's early years, and soon led to him bringing on a host of new employees to help expand its operations, including George Broussard, a high school friend who quickly became renowned within Apogee for his creativity and enthusiasm. Yet the studio would only truly become a household name after it partnered itself with id Software to publish both Commander Keen and Wolfenstein 3D on its behalf in the early 90s. The former proved one of the most popular side-scrollers on the PC at the time of its release, while the latter helped establish the first-person shooter genre, as well as pushed boundaries in terms of 3D graphics and violence like few other games before it. <music> Following Wolfenstein 3D's release, however, it decided to break ties with Apogee and publish its next shooter, Doom, on its own. At the time, Miller took the split in stride. He had suspected for a while that it would eventually want to jump ship, and felt confident that the breadth of titles that his company was developing and publishing without id's help would continue to keep it afloat. But when id finally released Doom in December of the following year, one of Apogee's biggest titles, a 2D side-scroller called Duke Nukem 2, suffered considerably in its wake, and it became apparent that they couldn't rest on their laurels. The original Duke Nukem had been released by Apogee less than a year after it published Commander Keen, and offered simple yet enjoyable platforming fun. Its story saw the eponymous Duke Nukem embark on a three-episode long quest to stop the villainous Dr. Proton from taking over the world, with the first episode focusing on his adventures through a ruined Los Angeles, the second on his escapades within Proton's secret moon base, and the third on his travels through a dystopian, technocratic future. While neither its gameplay nor its graphics had much to offer that gamers hadn't seen before, most who gave it a shot were taken by its charm and polish, and before long, it managed to become one of Apogee's biggest homegrown hits. Duke Nukem 2 had entered development shortly afterwards and was shaping up to be one of the studio's more impressive titles, as well as a massive step up from what its predecessor had offered. Its gameplay remained almost entirely the same, and its story, 
which involved an evil race of aliens called the Regelitans kidnapping Duke, wasn't all that more complex. But its graphics and sound were tremendously improved, with nearly every single level within the sequel's lengthy four-odd episodes sporting far richer sprite work than anything present in its predecessor. Even though it still wasn't quite at the head of its class when it came to 2D side-scrollers, there was little fear that Duke Nukem 2 wouldn't clean up when it finally released. By the luck of the draw, however, it ended up coming out a week before Doom, and when the latter arrived, Duke's second adventure almost immediately fell out of favor with the masses. To most PC players, its second shooter wasn't just a stellar follow-up to Wolfenstein, it was a graphical and technical showcase, as well as unmistakable proof that the future of PC gaming would revolve around experiences of its nature. 3D games were in, and 2D games, like Duke Nukem, were out. Eager to show that it was just as committed to this new landscape as anyone else, Apogee created a new brand name, 3D Realms, that would be devoted exclusively to publishing three-dimensional action games, and began working on a number of titles that would bear this moniker. It's within this context that the studio started developing Duke Nukem 3D. Even before the fallout surrounding Duke Nukem 2's release, it was as obvious as the day was long to Apogee's staff that the world of Duke Nukem was ripe for a 3D adaptation. Its eponymous protagonist was already plenty familiar with using guns, and the world he inhabited had no shortage of interesting locales begging to be realized with an extra dimension. Once its development actually started, however, it was less obvious how they were going to set this adaptation apart from all of its competitors in terms of gameplay. In a 2015 retrospective on PC Games N, George Broussard would recall how they initially set out to clone what id was doing with Doom and trust that eventually, they'd veer off its path and arrive at new and original content. The team assigned to 3D's development included a mix of virtuosos, new and old, such as Duke Nukem co-creator Todd Replogel, and a bright new hire by the name of Randy Pitchford. But their combined intellect couldn't make up for the fact that there were so few other reference points at the time for what a three-dimensional shooter could be, and how theirs could go against the grain. As a result, while everyone involved would work diligently over the next two years to make Duke Nukem 3D into a shooter of the utmost quality, the team would only stumble upon some of the game's more unique features towards the end of its development. After the length of said development provided them with a solid grasp on what their creation was, and how they could distinguish it from its peers. Making it so that some of the game's levels would take place within real-world settings was one of these late development masterstrokes, as were features like slopes, moments of interactivity like playing pool, and, most significantly, Duke Nukem's voice. I'm looking good. The latter came about after Broussard and programmer Jim Dose noted that the protagonist of LucasArts's Full Throttle sounded like what they imagined Duke would probably sound like if he had a voice, and came to realize that they would be depriving the game of a huge boon if they kept him silent. By this point in time, Everyone on the team was becoming increasingly comfortable with filling out the world of Duke Nukem 3D with as much personality and pop culture references as possible. Having a protagonist at the front and center of it who could talk wouldn't just be novel, it would provide them with a new, seamless way to impart this personality and pop culture while the game was running. Even though Apogee didn't have a dedicated quality assurance team during this period, the studio made a point of rigorously playtesting everything that they put in the game throughout this entire process. When staff would complete their work for the day, they would inevitably find their way back towards a keyboard and mouse, and spend hours upon hours running through all of the game's content. They were determined to ensure players got their hands on the best possible product they could muster, and when Duke Nukem 3D finally arrived at storefronts in 1996, the millions of players who picked it up were smitten with their results. After spending the past several years playing through shooters that almost entirely took place in foreign landscapes and featured mute protagonists, the real-life locales, high degree of interactivity, and endlessly verbose protagonist of Apogee's opus were a revelation, as well as entertaining like few other things they'd experienced before. Combined together, these three features made Duke Nukem 3D's environments feel like more than just a collection of winding hallways and enemy encounters. They made them feel like a farcical 80s action movie come to life. That the game also featured an endlessly entertaining collection of eccentric guns, solid level design, and an even better multiplayer suite on top of all this was icing on the cake. 
The only major aspect of the game that didn't sit well with everyone was some of its racier content. Duke made no attempts to hide some of his chauvinist tendencies, particularly when interacting with in-game characters of the opposite gender, and the world around him generally provided ample opportunity for these tendencies to come out. This, as well as a wide variety of other adult content in the game, would become the subject of criticism of players and non-players alike, who believed that such content, at best, distracted from the game's stronger moments, and at worst, was morally questionable. And as the video game industry would mature and grow over the years that would follow, their criticisms would only become more pronounced. But at the time of Duke Nukem 3D's release, most players found it easy to forgive, ignore, or even indulge in the game's brazenness and just enjoy the ride. The next several years would see Duke Nukem 3D ported to almost every console under the sun, as well as receive a bevy of official and fan-made expansions. Almost all of these ports and expansions would be created by outside talent, such as Indianapolis-based developer Sunstorm Interactive, and help introduce an even wider audience to the charms of 3D Realms' Golden Boy. A number of 3D Realms' staff would use this period to cash out their earnings and retire, or strike out on their own to apply the lessons they'd learnt working on Duke Nukem elsewhere, such as Pitchford, who would depart the studio to work on expansions to Valve Software's Half-Life series. The majority of the team, however, stuck behind and began working to usher in a new era for the company. Within a few months, its staff switched over to solely using the 3D Realms name to brand themselves in order to distance themselves from their 2D output in years past. And a few months after that, they started preliminary work on the fourth official installment in the Duke Nukem series, Duke Nukem Forever. Originally, Duke Nukem Forever was conceived as a platforming game that would harken back to the designs of Duke Nukem 1 and 2, while retaining the interactivity and character of 3D. Dr. Proton was set to return with a harebrained scheme to take over the state of California, and Duke would have had access to a wide range of returning and original weapons that he could do battle with, including an invisibility cloak. Eventually, however, the team decided to put these plans on ice, and instead focus on making Forever another shooter. In April 1997, 3D Realms publicly announced that this iteration of Forever was on its way, and that it wanted to get it out the door no later than mid-1998. The studio was adamant from the get-go that the Duke Nukem sequel was not going to be something that would take up a considerable amount of time or effort. Its staff wanted to make another quality product, but they also wanted to get it out the door quickly so that they could focus on whatever would come next. In an interview with IGN in 2017, Miller would reveal that at some point, they even drafted up a basic outline of what they wanted to do with Duke Nukem 5 after Forever's completion. In this hypothetical fifth entry, Players would have played through the first third of the game as a female confidant of Duke named Bombshell, before switching back over to the cigar-chomping protagonist in unexpected fashion. Forever was not going to be its series' end cap, or its be-all, end-all experience. It was simply going to be one of many Duke Nukem games to come. There was only one slight problem. The team didn't yet have the engine that they planned on using with Forever. When 3D Realms developed Duke Nukem 3D, they had used a proprietary engine called the Build Engine to bring its world to life. It had served its purpose well, and been used in a number of other hit games in the months that had followed, including Shadow Warrior and Monolith Productions' Blood. But a year onward, it was apparent to all that it was starting to look dated. As a result, the company had asked id Software if they could use its Quake 2 engine to power forever. The latter engine was still under construction and would eventually only come out by the end of 1997, but upon its completion, it would grant the studio access to graphical capabilities far beyond what it was currently capable of, and keep it neck and neck with whatever its competitors had to offer. When the studio finally received the Quake 2 engine in December, however, it was underwhelmed by its capabilities. It needed something a smidge stronger, and soon, a candidate presented itself, the Unreal Engine. It wasn't a quantum leap forward from its technology, but it offered even more realistic graphics, as well as the ability to create wide-open spaces with greater ease. The latter was key, as at this point in time, the team had decided that Forever's plot would feature Duke fighting aliens in the deserts around Las Vegas. One thing led to another, and 3D Realms switched engines again. 
Doing so effectively forced the team to scrap everything they'd constructed using the Quake 2 engine and start Forever's development over once more. But even after the team got its bearings with Unreal, progress on Forever was still slow going, and release dates were repeatedly missed. In interviews at the time, Broussard and others within the company would blame its protracted development on a number of factors, such as the complexity that came with making fully three-dimensional models for all of the game's characters, or all of the patches that the Unreal Engine kept receiving. While these factors undeniably helped complicate things for 3D Realms, a 2009 Wired article by Clive Thompson on Forever's development would reveal that Broussard himself was also at the center of many of the game's delays. The game designer simply couldn't tolerate the idea of Duke Nukem being anything less than perfect, and as a result kept trying to plus its design with features from other games that caught his eye. When he would manage to push a new feature through, the entire game would be consequently pushed back, and the whole cycle would then repeat itself. Despite all of this, 3D Realms would buy itself plenty of leeway to keep tinkering with its designs in the year 2000, when it convinced Take-Two Interactive to purchase Duke Nukem's publishing rights and it would buy itself the goodwill of impatient fans the world over in 2001 when it released an incredible new trailer for Duke Nukem Forever at that year's E3. While the question of when Forever would arrive was still up in the air, the trailer did wonders for Duke Nukem's fanbase. If Forever was going to look as good as the brief snippet suggested, then there was nothing to be lost from waiting just a little longer. And by this point in time, those who couldn't wait a little longer had no shortage of Duke Nukem spin-offs to help keep themselves placated. The first of these spin-offs, Duke Nukem Time to Kill, had been developed by Orlando-based developer N-Space and arrived on the original PlayStation a year and a half after 3D's release. Its story saw Duke travel across time and space to prevent an alien menace from altering history, while its gameplay featured a mixture of gunplay and platforming similar in style to the Tomb Raider series, a stylistic choice that the game itself humorously referenced during its opening hours. While reviews weren't overwhelmingly positive, Time to Kill ended up performing well enough at retail to spawn two direct follow-ups. The first one, Duke Nukem Land of the Babes, had seen the series' titular protagonist thrust into a whimsical future inhabited solely by women, and been poorly received. The second, Duke Nukem Zero Hour, had been developed by Eurocom exclusively for the Nintendo 64, and offered a more action-focused reimagining of Time to Kill's basic premise. Duke was still on a quest across time to prevent aliens from altering history, but the locales that he explored tended to emphasize gunplay over parkouring up walls, or doing other, Lara Croft-like activities. Most players ended up far preferring it to Land of the Babes, though it wouldn't quite find the same level of success in the long run as other Nintendo 64 shooters like Goldeneye or Turok. Finally, a year after the 2001 Forever trailer, fans were treated to Duke Nukem Manhattan Project, a side-scroller developed by Sunstorm Interactive. Manhattan Project followed in the footsteps of 3D Realms' original 2D version of Duke Nukem Forever, and featured a mix of mechanical and narrative elements from all three of its series' mainline entries, with its story pitting Duke against a villain reminiscent of the first game's Dr. Proton. Players generally agreed that while it didn't do anything that was especially standout or innovative, it was still a slick, polished experience, and contained one of the best depictions of its series' protagonist not conceived by 3D Realms. After Manhattan Project, Duke Nukem spin-offs would be relegated exclusively to handhelds and mobile phones. Most of these titles would be equally uneven in terms of quality, with Duke Nukem Advance offering up a surprisingly decent adaptation of the series for the Game Boy Advance in 2002, and Duke Nukem Critical Mass providing a universally reviled adaptation for the Nintendo DS in 2011. At the end of the day, however, no single spin-off that saw release before or during this period would go on to become as beloved as Duke Nukem 3D, or as hyped as Duke Nukem Forever. Even during some of the best moments of Manhattan Project or Advance, the latter perennially remained the series' most alluring project. Unfortunately, by the mid-2000s, there was still no sign of when Forever was coming. Rumors, leaks, and occasional statements from 3D Realms itself continued to suggest that it was alive, 
but many were beginning to fear that the shooter was destined to never materialize. While 3D Rums' staff weren't quite as doer themselves at this time, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the capacity at which they were operating and the decision-making of their bosses were deeply flawed. In the 2009 Wired article, Thompson would detail how by 2003, only 18 people were working on Forever full-time, a large amount of people by the standards of the 90s, but a fairly small one by the standards of the era they were now operating in. In any other development situation during this time, this issue alone would have been a significant hindrance, but 3D Rums' situation was made all the more worse by the fact that Broussard, ever the perfectionist, was still trying to incorporate every feature that caught his attention in other games into Forever. After seeing Computer Artworks' video game adaptation of The Thing during the early 2000s, for example, he suddenly started pushing for their title to include snow levels, despite there being no particular need to have Duke explore the Arctic. Further exacerbating Broussard's bad tendencies were the means by which 3D Realms was funding the project. Unlike most other studios at the time, 3D Realms was paying for Forever's development entirely by itself. It received almost no financial support from Take-Two Interactive, despite the latter being the series' publisher. And as a result, Broussard felt little pressure to complete things in a timely manner. He believed that as long as their war chest from the Duke Nukem 3D days was still around, they could work on the game indefinitely. Finally, after years of operating under these circumstances, a rebellion broke out in 2006. Many of 3D Realms' staff were frustrated that they had nothing to show after spending nearly a decade working on the game, as well as increasingly envious of some of the higher salaries the studio's competitors were offering, and they wanted out. By August, nearly half of the team working on Forever had left, and its outlook was looking grim. Desperate to keep it from fully falling apart, Broussard made a final concerted push to bring it back on track hiring a number of experienced developers whom he believed would enable the studio to finish the game. In the end, however, this push proved futile. While these new hires allowed Forever's development to make considerable progress over the next few years, the studio ultimately found itself strapped for cash by 2009, as well as unable to negotiate more money out of a greatly frustrated Take-Two. Down on their luck and out of options, Miller and Broussard laid off almost everyone at 3D Realms, and Take-Two sued what was left of the studio for failing to complete the game. Duke Nukem Forever was no more, but 3D Realms' now former staff wouldn't quit. Determined to finish the shooter no matter what it took, several of its former employees decided to take its future into their own hands and began working on it from their homes. They had no roadmap of when and how they were going to finish it, but they couldn't imagine a future in which they didn't provide it with some sort of closure. Litigations be damned. It's at this point that Randy Pitchford stepped back into the series' picture. In the intervening years since leaving 3D Realms, Pitchford had founded Gearbox Software and made a name for himself with shooters like Brothers in Arms and Borderlands. While he had cut himself off from the day-to-day -day of Forever's development, he continued to remain in touch with most of the people who were working on it, and when he caught wind of their efforts to keep it from dying, he saw an opportunity to give back to those who had given him everything. If the right decisions were made, he could be their savior, the one who could rescue them from the hell that they had created for themselves. Pitchford convened with Miller and Broussard on the prospects of doing so, and within a matter of months, he managed to figure out a path forward for the project. Gearbox would take control of the Duke Nukem IP, and in doing so, assume the burden of 3D Realms' lawsuit. It would use its good standing with Take-Two, which had previously published Borderlands, to convince the publisher to back off from the lawsuit. Then, finally, with Take-Two's blessing, it would finish forever once and for all. The gambit worked, and in early 2010, Gearbox took over 3D Realms' long gestating project. However, while Gearbox would play a significant role in getting it ready to ship after this point, a sizable chunk of its development over the final year and a half would actually be handled by the 3D ROM staff whom had been working out of their homes, as well as a Vancouver-based studio called Piranha Games. The former, which were now operating as a new studio called Triptych Games within Gearbox's offices, would help finish up forever single-player content, while the latter would help bring together much of its back-end engineering and multiplayer component. Most fans were as surprised as they were excited when news of all this became public. After going over a decade with nary a hint of when 3D Realms' title would finally be released, 
and then witnessing the studio's seeming demise. Learning that Forever was still on its way was nothing short of miraculous. But the proof was always going to be in the pudding. And when Forever finally landed on store shelves in June of 2011, those who played it were dismayed to discover that underneath this surprise and excitement laid a deeply flawed shooter. Its gameplay was creaky and filled with a mountain of half-baked ideas plucked tactlessly from other series. Its graphics were dated, if not downright ugly, and its writing was far more juvenile and crude than almost any prior entry in the series. Duke's adventures had always indulged in shameless racy humor, but they had also featured entertaining satire and wordplay. He tipped strippers and peed in toilets, and also spouted cleverly phrased jabs at 3D realms as competitors. Forever had fleeting moments of the latter over its 12-hour long narrative, which saw Duke come to blows once more with 3D's extraterrestrial menace, but they were repeatedly offset by a dozen of other moments that were as puerile as they were tasteless, including an infamous sequence where players were presented with the option to play with feces. In his 2017 interview with IGN, Scott Miller would suggest that Gearbox was partially to blame for Forever's lack of refinement, claiming that Triptych was severely understaffed when it was assigned its share of the game's development during its final stretch, and that Gearbox should have provided it with more manpower in its hour of need. A game as troubled as Forever was always going to have its blemishes, but if Pitchford Studio had pitched in more, they might have been able to elevate its stronger moments. At the time of Forever's release, however, a number of figures attached to its development would turn around and claim that games journalists had simply set their expectations too high when reviewing it. Perhaps most infamously, the Redner Group, a PR agency that helped handle media relations for the game's launch, would claim on Twitter that reviewers had injected too much venom in their evaluations and that it would be withholding review copies of future games from them in retaliation. While Take-Two broke ties with the Redner Group shortly afterwards, other people who had been critical of the way Forever was received, such as Pitchford and Gearbox co-founder Brian Martell, would continue to hold on to their animosity for some time after. However, Pitchford would acknowledge later on that the game was a product of the struggles it faced over its development, and that at the end of the day, hype goes both ways. Players might have set expectations high for how good Forever was going to be, but so did 3D Realms. Duke Nukem Forever was followed later in the year by a pair of downloadable content packs, with the second of these packs, The Doctor Who Cloned Me, offering a new single-player campaign that pitted Duke once more against Dr. Proton. Most critics agreed that the campaign offered a more cohesive and polished experience than the game it was based on, but ultimately couldn't quite escape its fundamental problems. Since then, Duke's outings have been sporadic and of varying quality. In 2013 and 2016, Fans looking to relive the series' halcyon days were treated to Duke Nukem 3D, Megaton Edition, and 20th Anniversary World Tour Edition, respectively. The former offered a newly remastered version of 3D Realms' classic shooter with three of its expansions in tow, while the latter offered a slightly different remaster that came packaged with an entirely new set of levels, each set in a different city around the globe. Neither represented a grand return to form for the series, and more discerning fans would hold them in lower regard than other community-developed remasters of Duke Nukem 3D, such as eDuke 32. Yet on the whole, players found them a welcome breath of fresh air coming off of forever. Then in 2017, those vying for a more modern Duke adventure were treated to Duke Nukem's Bulletstorm Tour, an add-on to Bulletstorm Full Clip Edition that allowed players to experience the entirety of its campaign as the king himself. On paper, the idea seemed sound. Few aspects were more characteristic of Duke than his machismo humor, and few other games since his debut had been as similarly brazen as the Polish-developed shooter. In practice, however, its execution proved lackluster. Watching Duke interact with Bulletstorm's cast and world yielded genuine moments of comedy, but the amount of new moves and lines that he brought to the experience were disappointingly few, and the amount of times his lips actually synced up with these lines were fewer still. When and where Duke will appear next remains to be seen. In an interview with IGN in the fall of 2017, Pitchford stated that the series was in need of some sort of new design paradigm something that will allow it to shake up the market and stand out from its rivals. In the same way that Duke Nukem 3D had used its character and interactivity to stand out from its own rivals in 1996. It's unlikely that Gearbox will return to the series until this design paradigm is found, and it's unlikelier still that most of its employees utterly look forward to doing so. 
Even though Duke Nukem remains one of the video game industry's most recognizable protagonists, his questionable traits are more apparent than ever today, and any attempt to reboot him would be burdened with figuring out how to quash them while still preserving his essence. Moreover, it's hard to say where Duke Nukem currently fits in Gearbox's portfolio, with Borderlands so prominently at the studio's forefront. While the Borderlands titles are much different in terms of gameplay than what 3D realms of shooters used to offer, their writing has always been silly and off-color in most of the ways that the Duke Nukem games were silly and off-color. But their overall worldview has managed to be much less demeaning, and their sales have proven considerably greater. The series may very well never return, but if Duke Nukem Forever taught the video game industry anything, it's that Duke's tenacity is not to be underestimated. Thank you for watching. We'd like to take this time to thank, by name, the generous patrons who have pledged to our Hall of Fame reward tier. Maktoum Saeed Al Maktoum, Paul Cousino, and those currently subscribed to our producer reward tier. Dari Rap Sigurdsson, EmuMovies.com, Lame Game Man, Milkshake, Schizo Lingvo. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and backing us on Patreon.